Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Monsters Manifested, right here on DM Tools with Max McCool. On today's episode, we're going to be continuing our journey through the demon monster type with the Merolith. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. The Merolith's lore can be found on page 53, along with all of the other demonic lore that we've covered in previous episodes, and its stat block can be found on page 61. So with all that said, let's begin with the lore. Terrible to behold, a Merolith has the lower body of a great serpent and the upper torso of a humanoid female with six arms. Wielding a wicked blade in each of its six hands, a Merolith is a devastating foe that few can match in battle. These demons possess keen minds and a finely honed sense of tactics, and they are able to lead and unite other demons in common cause. Meroliths are often encountered as captains at the head of a demonic horde, where they embrace any opportunity to rush headlong into battle. So that's all there is when it comes to the lore of the Merolith. Pretty interesting. So we now have an indicator of the hierarchy that the Merolith would stand in amongst the lower demons or lesser demons, if you would, which may be worthwhile to take into consideration when we're crafting an adventure. But before we get into all of that, let's move on to the stats. Actually, before we jump into the stats, there's a little bit of flavor text here on the page, which I'll cover before we dive into the more nitty gritty stats and mechanics focused section of the creature. This flavor text reads as follows. The temple was strewn with body parts. We concluded that the cultists had summoned a powerful demon and not lived to regret it. Not wanting to get hacked to pieces ourselves, we cut short our expedition and returned to the village of Homlet with our tails between our legs. Rufus and Byrne had a good laugh at our expense, let me tell you. As recorded by Nelume, a young half-elf wizard, chronicling her one and only visit to the temple of elemental evil. Hmm. That's an interesting little bit of flavor text, I suppose. Kind of aids in presenting the Merolith as this sort of devastating, whirling dervish type of monster to be contended with. But with all that out of the way, let's move on to the stats now, shall we? The Merolith is a large fiend, demon, with a chaotic evil alignment. It has an armor class of 18, which is natural armor. Hit points that average 189, or... 18d10 plus 90, and it has a movement speed of 40 feet. The Merolith has a strength of 18, a dexterity of 20, a constitution of 20, an intelligence of 18, a wisdom of 16, and a charisma of 20. Its saving throws include strength plus 9, constitution plus 10, wisdom plus 8, and charisma plus 10. The Merolith is resistant to the damage types of cold, fire, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons. It is also immune to the damage type of poison, and it is immune to the poisoned condition. The Merolith has the sense of true sight for 120 feet and a passive perception of 13. It speaks the languages of abyssal and telepathy for 120 feet. The Merolith has a challenge rating of 16. Onto the abilities. Magic resistance. The Merolith has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. Magical weapons. The Merolith's weapon attacks are magical. And reactive. The Merolith can take one reaction on every turn in a combat. Onto the actions. Multi attack. The Merolith makes seven attacks, six with its longswords and one with its tail. Longsword is a melee weapon attack with a plus nine to hit, a reach of five feet on one target. On a hit, it does an average of 13 or 2d8 plus four slashing damage. Tail is a melee weapon attack with a plus nine to hit, a reach of 10 feet on one creature. On a hit, it does an average of 15, or 2d10 plus 4 bludgeoning damage. If the target is medium or smaller, it is grappled, with an escape DC of 19. Until this grapple ends, the target is restrained. 
the Merolith can automatically hit the target with its tail, and the Merolith can't make tail attacks against other targets. Finally, teleport. The Merolith magically teleports, along with any equipment it is wearing or carrying, up to 120 feet to an unoccupied space that it can see. And lastly, the reaction. Parry. The Merolith adds 5 to its AC against one melee attack that would hit it. To do so, the Merolith must see the attacker and be wielding a melee weapon. And that's all there is when it comes to the stats of the Merolith. A pretty powerful and imposing monster, all things considered. It seems to certainly take on that role of sort of a boss monster, if you would, where it's got a lot of attacks, it's got some very solid abilities, and it's resistant to pretty much any type of damage that can be utilized against it. So now that we've gone through the lore and the stats of the Merolith, let's move on to some adventure crafting, shall we? Okay, so immediately the first thing that comes to mind for me when I'm looking at the Merolith and reading what it's capable of, I'm picturing something like a labyrinth or a maze where the Merolith is implemented in the final chamber of the entire structure. Now that might be because the Merolith appears to be something to the effect of a Medusa in appearance, a Gorgon in the traditional sense, just with six arms. But I think that the use of a labyrinthine structure that the adventurers have to traverse through to acquire something or perhaps destroy something accursed or something of that effect, maybe collect an item of some sort with the Merolith sort of on their tail or keeping them on their toes, if you would, where the Merolith can sort of present them with this challenge of a character or a creature or a monster, an enemy that can sort of bounce in and out of their field of view as they're traveling through this place. So since the Merolith can teleport 120 feet, I feel like the Merolith would be able to toy with the adventurers quite easily. And the Merolith obviously being a high CR monster with a high intelligence and charisma for that matter, actually, I think would be able to effectively divert or distract or otherwise antagonize the adventurers with their antics. So the way I would go with that is I would create a scenario where the players are sent off to this location. Let's call it a ruin or let's say an old underground temple or structure of some form. And their objective there, let's say, is to acquire some sort of item to assist in something for whomever has charged them with this task. So as Dungeon Master, if you were going the route of something like treasure hunters or sort of explorers, mystery solvers, something like that, you could generate a myth or a legend sort of surrounding this ancient place that is said to be cursed or said to be inhabited by these sort of long living immortal monsters and creatures that guard or protect this highly sought after antiquity or relic or something like that. And the adventurers, the players are, are charged with the task of going to clear out this area or going into this area solely to collect whatever item it may be. You could also go the route of something to the effect of legends or lore or rumors at the tavern have it that Within this temple lies an item of great power or perhaps the answer to some sort of question. Perhaps it retains the means of defeating or destroying a very powerful evildoer, be that a lich or a necromancer or some sort of highly powerful warlord or titan, something to that effect. However, it's very heavily guarded by monsters. Monsters of what sort? is up to you. You can even use the sort of broken telephone aspect of rumors and gossip and stuff, sort of changing things in and out. But if you wanted to lay a couple of breadcrumbs for your players, you could say that, oh, the 
legend has it, or my, you know, cousin's husband's brother's friend said that they saw the monster at the end of the chamber at the end of the the maze when they attempted to go through they made it all the way to the end but then they were faced by a medusa or something to that effect a massive snake monster and sort of leave your players guessing as to what the creature could be and that could lead to some interesting turnout because you could then have your players stock up and prepare for a certain type of battle and sort of throw a little curveball at them once they encounter the Merolith and they realize that it's not quite the creature that they thought it was that they'd have to go up against. And so then they'd have to adapt and kind of contend with it with what they have, which might not necessarily be optimal, which is not to diminish or minimize the prep and efforts of your players necessarily, but it's always fun to challenge the people at your table and see how they can adapt and be creative with this instance that they're not necessarily perfectly prepared for. And especially by the time your players get to the range that the Merolith is within in terms of challenge, being at a CR of 16 or a challenge rating of 16, if you have your players at the table that are at level 16-ish in and around there, they should have the means to take on and take out a Merolith, even if they're not optimally prepared anyway. But I could see the Merolith being a pretty tough creature to take on even at that level just due to how many attacks it has its resistances the fact that it can teleport that it can parry that it can can basically lock down a player with its tail it has a high escape dc but that is kind of a double-edged sword because the merolith then is prevented from making a multi-attack because it cannot make a tail attack once it has someone grappled or a creature grappled which was one thing I found very interesting was that they specified that the tail melee attack has a reach of 10 feet on one creature specifically rather than one target, meaning that the Merolith cannot necessarily, let's say, pick up a bookshelf with its tail and grapple it and throw it at the players or anything like that. It has to target a creature. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I digress. Yeah, I think that a labyrinthine sort of sequence of chambers or tunnels or a maze of some sort where the Merolith is the final boss that is guarding some item. Perhaps the item is on the Merolith. You know, you could then present the players with a cool item after they overcome and defeat the Merolith. Perhaps the capability that the Merolith has to teleport is not necessarily inherent. Perhaps there's an amulet or a talisman that it has that it carries, maybe a, like a necklace around the neck obviously, that uh, allows them to teleport these crazy distances so long as they can see, right? And once they overcome and defeat the Merolith, then they now have this item, this talisman of teleportation, right? Or the amulet of far step or something like that. And they can teleport these large distances, right? Which would be a nice reward for your players after taking on something so challenging as a Merolith. And then you could populate this catacomb or temple or maze like structure with lesser demons that are at the command of the Merolith. And you can have your players combat these demons to progress forward and try to make their way through this structure whilst the Merolith can come in and out, sort of teleport in, teleport out, tease the players, perhaps attack them with a surprise attack from behind, maybe escape if things are getting a little too tough for it. And the Merolith can even taunt the players and try to misguide them or mislead them, you know, lead them through this maze that has empty rooms or pathways that lead to nowhere or in a circle back to the beginning or perhaps into a pit or some sort of trap of some form. And the players have to sort of decide whether or not the Merolith is worthwhile to follow directly based on its instruction or to defy completely. And when it says go left, they go right. When it says go up, they go down, you know, and you can sort of create this interesting sequence of events that the adventurers have to go through in order to get to the Merolith that involves combat and a bit of sort of investigation and some cunning in order to get to the final chamber and defeat the Merolith and acquire the reward for completing the task. Another way that you could use a Merolith that I think could be cool and a little different would be in the form of basically exactly what they are. 
which is these captains or heads of a horde or an army, something like that. But the way that I would implement it, just to put a bit of a twist on things, which you don't have to necessarily do if you're going with something demon focused, demonic heavy, and something like that. That's sort of an overarching theme to your campaign. But if you were to use this as sort of a standalone instance, let's call it, or as just something to throw in that's new and fresh for your players. So it's not constantly the same thing. Something that I think could be cool to do would be to implement a Merolith as the captain of an army, but of a standard army, perhaps, you know, like your typical King's army, let's say, right? So for example, your players venture into town or they're in a town that is perhaps their home base, a place that they have found to be to their liking, that they're utilizing as their home that they've protected, you know, again, this is all within the premise of them being at level 16, but they don't have to be. And you, you can present this as a much longer arc or task that they would have to complete where they start off at a low level and the town or kingdom that they're in is constantly at war with a neighboring kingdom or some sort of rival empire. And perhaps there's a tentative peace or ceasefire as it were between the two for the time being, but eventually the opposing side will become the aggressor and will attack the kingdom and the players have to then scramble or do what they can to defend their homestead. But what you could do is you could present the Merolith as a captain of part of the army or the entire army where perhaps the ruling individual of the opposing force has managed to summon and discover and acquire the true name of the Merolith, right? Because with all of the demons and demon lords, they all have true names. And if an individual can learn a demon's true name, has the power to call the demon and exercise some measure of control over it, right? To command it to do its bidding in one way or another. So you could have an instance where Perhaps the magic man, if you would, or the vizier of the opposing empire or kingdom has managed to discover the true name of a demon and has gone through this arduous process of figuring out how to properly summon the demon and use its true name to control it, right? And has successfully done this and summoned a Merolith and has now charged the Merolith with the task of running and operating and leading the opposing army against your player's mainstay, home base, town or empire, anything like that. And I think that that could lead to an interesting encounter and scenario where it's sort of the height and the heat of this massive battle, this gigantic combat between these two sides or these two factions or teams, what have you. And your players have to contend with not only a massive army and strategize how to succeed and take on this opposing force on the battlefield, but they also have to be able to contend with a demonic seven-armed whirling dervish of a monster in the Merolith as the captain of the army. And to add to that, the Merolith is known for having a keen mind and, and a very strong sense of tactics and strategy. So you could have the Merolith play a role of strategist and tactician whilst in the middle of the fray. You know, the Merolith has six arms. They could be making hand signals or uttering commands to other squads or other battalions, stuff like that, whilst they're in the middle of the fray themselves. And your players have to be able to contend with the Merolith. Perhaps their entire task during this massive battle between these two kingdoms is just to figure out how to get to the Merolith to isolate it so they can manage to take it out and leave the opposing army with no strategist, with no captain, with no sense of leadership. And perhaps that can turn the tide of the battle. It can highly demoralize all of the other soldiers and fighters and stuff like that, all the other players on the battlefield, and perhaps lead them to take up ranks within your player's army itself. And perhaps they can then overtake the opposing kingdom or empire, or perhaps they can create more of a lasting peace or a ceasefire standstill as it were because of this threat that is so above and beyond the typical threat of just a powerful army with a good tactician or 
you know, a strong captain, something like that to lead them to victory has now been decimated by your players, right? And that can lead to something like the increase of wealth or treasure or morale or reputation for your players. If your players are very inclined or keen on evolving and building their home base, as it were, you could do something like that. Perhaps you could have them hire the opposing army or some of the fighters, perhaps a percentage of them will decide to or agree to join the players, the adventurers, and guard them, perhaps be something to the effect of companions. They could play guard to your player's castle or keep if they have one in their home location. So there's a lot of ways you could go with that if you were to use a Merolith as sort of the captain or leader of an army that's not necessarily just demons, right? You can keep something fresh and interesting where your players think that they're going to be going into your typical sword and board combat with just, you know, catapults and trebuchets and with archers on the rooftops and on the walls firing down at them. But in fact, the head of this army and the reason for its success and absolute dominance in its campaigns is the fact that they have this otherworldly demonic creature leading them because it is under the control of the opposing individual who has discovered their true name and used it to control them. All in all, though, I think that the Merolith is actually a pretty cool monster. I would definitely like to use it in one of my adventures one day. I think that there's a lot that can be done, especially because it looks similar to a type of monster that your players would sort of expect and be familiar with, but is not that monster. And its tactical and strategic ability leads to a lot of different potential opportunities or instances where you can use it in a way that's not necessarily bog standard monster of the week. And then you have its stats, which are pretty tough to overcome, even at the challenge rating that it's at. I could certainly see a Merolith being used as a boss monster if you wanted to go the route of just sort of a straight kick down the door, take out the monster, sort of meat grinder dungeon, if you would, where you just, as the players continue to go further and further and delve deeper and deeper into the chambers of the dungeon, the enemies get more and more deadly and stuff. And right at the end, the Merolith is there to take them on, which is absolutely doable and absolutely can be effective, especially if you're running something like a beer and pretzels game or just a one shot where your players have to go in and take on and take out some monster that's been harassing or causing havoc and destruction to a part of town or something like that. But I feel like the Merolith has a lot more potential in it to be something that's a little more out of the box and sort of different rather than something to the effect of like a large hulking beast. You know, I feel like there's a lot of those in the monster manual that can be used effectively. If you wanted to run something that was just sort of a quick pickup game where you go in and take out the monsters and collect the gold and get in and get out, I feel like the Merolith can be used in many other ways than just that sort of straightforward method. So I think that the Merolith could make for an interesting monster that's also a good boss monster that's also good at being able to throw your players for a loop because it's not just some sort of ravenous foaming at the mouth creature that just wants to destroy everything in its path, right? The Merolith has the ability to strategize and plan. It has a, a degree of tact that it can use in order to misguide your adventurers and lead them astray or perhaps even use them to its own ends. And then only at the final moments do your players realize that they've been had, right? That they've been led on by the Merolith and its antics. But that's all I got for you fine folks today when it comes to the Merolith and how to use it in an adventure, potentially. I'd like to thank you all very much for tuning in. I highly appreciate it. Next week's episode of Monsters Manifested, we'll be covering the Nalfeshni, which should be an interesting one. I'm already seeing a lot more in the way of lore for this creature relative to the previous demons. So hopefully there's something in there that's a solid little chunk of something that we can make use of and utilize for our adventures. But until then, thank you all once again very much for tuning in. Please feel free to leave a rating or a review or anything like that wherever you can for the podcast as it would help the podcast out and it would help me out and I'd appreciate that very much. If you were listening to this podcast on YouTube, I'd kindly ask that you 
like, comment, subscribe, share, all those fun things help the podcast grow, help the channel grow, help this get to the ears of more budding DMs or DMs with a creative block or perhaps some burnout that just need a hand in developing an adventure for the players at their table or that want to come up with something that's sort of different from what they typically would do or or just a way to generate some ideas and sort of get a kickstart in developing an adventure that they would like to run. But with all that said, thank you all very much and I'll see you on the next one. Have a good day, everyone.